There we got it. All righty. So welcome to another lecture by me, Adam Franti, about my favorite um, person, medieval person with a disability, God's fun for looking at. So this is uh, it's called Good Friends and Comrades. And because this is largely predominantly a HEMA audience, I want to talk a little bit about how Gotts used his autobiography partially, not 100%. Like he wasn't, he definitely wasn't writing like a how to manual on how to prosecute a feud, certainly not in the 1550s when it was very illegal and had been, you know, out of, out of practice for a long time. But he does use his autobiography, and in his autobiography, he does describe quite a bit of a certain sort of applied art of how to successfully feud and what the limitations of feuds are and sort of how sometimes uh, personal combat works within a feud. So if you want to ask some questions, um, go ahead and just like throw them in the chat. <clears throat> and then at the end, um, we can get to them there. So we'll, we'll kind of do a brief overview of his life and then talk a, a bit about some of the more important uh, feuds or wars or conflicts that he was involved in uh, as we go along. So, but yeah, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, I'm gonna leave some time at the end to be able to answer those and, uh, and just let me know. So without further ado. So Gotts, uh, this is by the way, my favorite image of Gotts that I just found. And it's from, so it's from a Dutch museum uh, and they labeled it circa 1600. And they do claim that this is Gotts von Berlichingen, and it does not show him with, you know, well, it does show him with an iron hand, but he's wearing gauntlets. So <laughs> um, this, I assume, would be after his death, uh, but there are a couple of details that definitely shows that he is at least at Berlichingen. Um, and most notably, if you look at the top left up there, his uh, family sigil has two wolves in it, and he actually points this out in his autobiography at one point because during a feud, he looks over in a field as he's sort of riding to ambush somebody and he sees wolves pursuing a flock of sheep and he wishes them good luck because uh, he's got two wolves on his, on his family crest and he considered that a good omen for his feud. Um, so I know that that is the Berlichingen uh, Wappen and the black and white coloring is probably from the Hohenzollern uh, family, which uh, his family was sort of affiliated with uh, in quite a lot of ways through his whole career. So. The kind of brief sketch of his life, he was born the youngest son of uh, another kind of poor knight named Killian von Berlichingen in 1481, and he lived until 1562. And it was probably in the last year or so uh, of his life that he dictated probably the autobiography. So the dictation is, is, was put forward by uh, the, one of his biographers, one of the translators of his, or one of his biographers, yeah. Um, named Umschneider, and Umschneider wrote kind of the definitive version of his autobiography and published it uh, <clears throat> quite a while ago. But um, he suggests that it probably was dictated and not written. And there are a couple of times where Gotts actually talks about having to write something with his own hand. And at one point, he's trying to write like a letter when he's in prison, and he has to send for a clerk and he doesn't say why, but you can assume that maybe the, the letter that he wrote with his own hand was, you know, maybe not terribly legible. So, um, but his autobiography is a bit strange in some ways. It's, um, it's not necessarily a full accounting of his life. Um, he leaves a lot of his personal details very private. So for instance, he uh, he converted to Protestantism uh, probably around 1519, 1520 or so. And he never really describes that process. He never really describes much about his personal life. He doesn't describe um, either of his two marriages. He doesn't really describe the birth of his children. He doesn't describe uh, much of his sort of friendship or personal life at all. It's literally just an account, he says, of his feuds, wars, and dangers or adventures or uh, what have you. And a lot of it is from the perspective of, of almost a, like a political apologia, like he's writing them because at a certain point he was, uh, he was told by friends um, and maybe suspected uh, to a certain extent that some of the things that he had done in his life, which were all almost all totally illegal, um, might get his progeny, his heirs into trouble. And so he wrote this sort of apologia to kind of give forward the best version of the things that he had done in these feuds and wars and the, the decisions that he made that were maybe politically unpopular or whatever. 
as a way to safeguard uh, his legacy and safeguard his property for his heirs, uh, because there was a chance that something like the Swabian League or Charles V or another of the Holy Roman Emperors might look on the Berlickians as people not to be trusted because of the kind of somewhat uneven reputation that Gotts had during his, his whole life. Um, and uh, just as kind of a quick count, he was involved in at least eight wars, which are different than feuds, of which he, he, count, he counted 11, which I can tell you from having read the autobiography are not all of them. Uh, at one point, he actually describes getting into a feud that sort of snowballed into five separate conflicts, um, all that were started by like one guy who wasn't paid for winning an archery contest. So you can imagine how complicated some of these get and how big some of them are. Uh, the first time he actually takes the field against the forces of Nuremberg is in 1502. And that's during a feud that was waged by another robber knight against the entire city of Nuremberg that involved a battle that involved several thousand people. And it's that wasn't a war, that was a feud. And feuds and wars are different, even if some of them involve shooting cannons at people. So it's the 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 distinctions between these are somewhat blurry. And generally he he uh, talks about um, his, for the most part, it's translated as adventure um, or reuteri. And a reuteri just means sort of like uh, nightly coup, uh, nightly adventure, um, things like that. So anyway, he's involved in a lot of this stuff. Um, and from a very young age in 1495, he actually attended the Diet of Worms and like was there for months uh, during with some of like the most important people in the empire. Um, he met the emperor and recognized him later on. Uh, he's got a, a, a funny anecdote at one point when he's, uh, it's in the Swiss war and the forces of the, the empire are coming down and trying to force a Swiss city to surrender. And he's out there waiting and this guy in green comes up and he describes his costume and everything. And it's like a green caplet and a green hat and a green jerkin and green hose. And, uh, you know, he says he recognized the emperor because he'd seen him at Worms. And he knew him for his nose. The, uh, the Maximilian uh, Habsburg nose was very, it was very common. And he, he ends by saying, it was a good attempt by the emperor. <laughs> um, so anyway, like, even though he was a poor knight, which he says very frequently, poor in the sense that he didn't have any money, um, he, he did rub evils with some of the most powerful people in Europe uh, at the time. And he sort of worked for and worked against some of the most powerful people in the empire at various points in his very long career. So poor knights tend to uh, describe the kind of people who are noble. They have you know papers and patents of nobility. They're considered nobles, they're considered knights, they're considered people who are landowning aristocracy, but tend to be fairly land poor. Um, Gotts, uh, his family owned a small sort of mans and some lands around a place called Jagsthausen, and that was in basically orbiting around the Hohenzollern lands, and he, Gotts worked as a page from a pretty young age um, for Margrave Friedrich von Brandenburg Ansbach. Ansbach is the modern uh, city name, and it was called Onelsbach uh, in the 16th century, at least according to Gotts. So he worked as a page for a long time for the guy pictured there to the right. Um, and that is Margrave Friedrich. Uh, Margrave Friedrich himself is a fairly interesting dude, but we won't get into that because it might take a really long time. Uh, suffice to say, he was disinherited by his sons, who were actually friends of Gotts uh, in about 1514 because they claimed that he had lost his mind. So just some interesting stuff there. But in any case, so one of the ways that you could, as a poor knight, earn some influence and kind of go up a few tiers in the sort of social hierarchy was by working as a page or a courtier in the court of somebody more powerful. So if you could hook up your son uh, with sort of the duties of a page or a cupbearer or a servant in a, a noble household, you would because they would be there to earn or to learn how to move about courts and they could learn kind of the finer parts of um, sort of knightly and aristocratic intercourse, right? That way you can learn how to write a polite letter. You can learn what the common ways are to be polite in company. You can learn how to talk to women. You can learn how to sing and dance. Um, and you also obviously have to like serve the wine and be a part of the household as well. So this was uh, after uh, the death of Gotz's uncle, 
which he attended uh, during the Diet of Worms. And uh, he used this for, you know, to find some, some social leverage uh, to an extent. But his real, um, the real important bits, at least for, for Gotts and his uh, development as a man of war, was the fact that because of his position in the Hohenzollern court, he served in the invasion of Burgundy in 1497 and in the Swiss War in 1499. And at both times he served as a page to Margrave Friedrich and as a servant or body servant directly to Friedrich's sons. Um, it was after his return from the campaign in Burgundy where he got into basically like the first kind of fight that he ever really got into or at least described in his autobiography, which was when he was wearing a big old coat that he had actually gotten made for him uh, in the campaign in Burgundy. This was uh, a common thing that actually crops up a few times, the way that Gotts is paid, or at least initially paid, was to have a suit of clothes made for him for this campaign. So he's, this is the first time he's kind of serving in an official capacity, and he gets this big coat made. And the next summer, or over the winter, when he's still at the court, he tries to like squeeze in next to this Polish knight who he says had his hair dressed with egg and it messes up the guy's hair. So the Polish knight grabs a bread knife and tried to stab him. And Gotts tells us that he was able to stay calm. And even though he was like straddling the bench that he was trying to sit down on, um, he was wearing two swords. He had a short little one and he had a longer one. And he said, despite the fact that this guy like basically just tried to kill him, he drew the short little one and, and only beat the Polish knight around the head with it. Um, and after that, there was a whole lot of like politics. Uh, he was eventually convinced to basically be arrested and held in one of the tower rooms for only a quarter of an hour. He actually had to be like talked into it by the sons of Margrave Friedrich who told him like, it's just for show, you know, <laughs> We just want to make sure that our mom, who is a Polish princess, she's Princess Sophia of Poland, um, to, to be happy and to have a happy household. So he reluctantly agreed to be arrested for the first time, serving a sentence of 15 minutes, uh, and then he was let out. So this is a really minor incident. Um, he brings it up a couple of times a little bit later, saying that he ran into some of these other Polish knights later, and they had fights, and he wanted to kick one guy's ass, but he couldn't because he ran off, and it was dark, and you know that kind of thing. But it was, it gives us a lot to think about as fencers. And it gives us a lot to think about in terms of how appropriate responses, you know, would have to be mitigated by political factors, right? So like Guts probably would have been justified if he pulled out his really big sword and ran the guy through, right? Because he tried to kill him. He, he tried to stab him with a knife. That's not good. But he also was aware that that was probably going a little too far. And if he wanted to keep good relations with the Margrave and the Margrave's sons and the Margrave's wife, who is a princess, then he probably should maybe not kill people in the court, right? And a lot of what Gotts describes, a lot of what he describes, even when he's talking about wars uh, and when he's talking about like really large scale feuds and conflicts that he's having with like whole countries at some point, this sort of element of restraint, this, this, ability for him to perceive the sort of limits of what his actions would be appropriate in certain circumstances is a really, really, really big part of the sort of art of the feud that he develops over the next couple of decades uh, of experience. Um, this is a uh, woodcut, an illustrated woodcut of the Battle of Dornach in 1499. This is part of the Swiss War. Um, and uh, Mostly it's just there for show, right? Uh, the Swiss war was a pretty big war. The empire got their asses absolutely kicked. Um, and Gotts was just kind of around the, 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 the Hohenzollern kind of court. Uh, he wasn't part of the Battle of Dornach. He wasn't around in any of the major actions, but he did participate a couple of times uh, in some skirmishes. And he also helped to blow up a church at one point. So he was involved and he was uh, a couple of times describes people getting killed next to him with the guns and cannons and things. Um, and he helped to pack a church tower full of gunpowder and then light it off. And that was uh, the first time he says he kind of served uh, in a kind of more martial capacity rather than um, as a boy, right? Rather than as a page or just a messenger or errand boy. Um, so he's got a lot of experience, even as a young man. Uh, again, he's not even 20 yet in, in 1499. And uh, he sort of 
he's able to kind of transition from that that sort of sense that he's just a poor knight to what other people and mostly Nuremberg's might characterize as robber knights, right? And a robber knight is, if you think about being a poor knight, uh, a nobleman who has, you know, you're strapped into this honor system, you're strapped into this system that says like, you can't not respond when people insult you. And you have this long kind of cultural sort of uh, ability to respond in terms of feuding, right? And a feuding is a legal process. It's not just like you want to go kick somebody's ass so you you go do it. Like you have to like basically file paperwork. Um, it's called an ob clock. You have to like have this altercation. You have to write down what the causes was and then give the guy a chance to respond. And if they don't respond in the way that you want them to, which is usually to give you money or offer an apology, you send them an ob clock. Um, that starts everything, right? And so even though Gotts is doing something that is considered socially legitimate, it was actually illegal. So after 1495, uh, Maximilian the emperor uh, proclaimed what he called the, the Eviger Landfry, which is the peace of the empire, the peace of the land, right? Um, the eternal peace. And that essentially outlawed knightly feuding. And as we'll see, this didn't really bother Gotts or Pauls von Absberg or Thalacker or any of the other people that he rode with. They still did it because it, it may have been illegal, but it was considered so socially important for at least this class of men that they continued doing it despite the legal risks. And in part, probably because of the legal risks. Um, it's really similar to the kind of later expressions of, of dueling that we see between citizens and burghers of, of free imperial towns that part of the allure of doing a duel is the fact that it is illegal. And it's the fact that both of you could be caught and very severely punished, but your honor is more important than that. And so uh, right after leaving the court, the Hohenzollern court uh, following the Swiss war, um, he sort of hooks up with his cousin, Hans von Massenbach, um, who's generally known as Thalacker uh, afterwards. So he just calls him Thalacker the whole time. And for the next three or four years, he rides with them learning the ropes of feuds. Um, Thalacker was a notorious robber knight uh, and Paulus von Absberg was part of an enormous family of poor knights, uh, the, Absberg, uh, the Absberg family. This is their Wappen, this is their coat of arms. Um, and he rode with uh, Paulus von Absberg a couple of times and uh, Thomas von Absberg even shows up a couple of times in his autobiography who is uh, a, another very notorious, um, very violent robber knight. Um, He's in the same sort of uh, same sort of scale as Konschat, who is a person that Gotts eventually buys a castle from, and both of them were reputed by Nuremberg. So we should be suspicious of anything Nuremberg says about any of these guys because they definitely hated them. Um, they were both known to be exceptionally cruel to their prisoners, and they at one point would like cut off their hands and send them back to the Nure to Nuremberg. Uh, with different demands, and they were apparently very violent and very brutal. But again, there's this sort of ongoing propaganda war between the Free Knight side and Nuremberg almost all the time. So, you know, we should be fairly skeptical of any of the information that we get from either side in any of this, because both of them were trying to convince everyone else that, you know, they are the problem. It's that Spider-Man meme of everybody pointing at one another. It's, it's your fault, right? So, um, Riding with Hans von Massenbach, one of the things we sort of get a good sense of very early on is that the way that you successfully prosecute a feud is not necessarily to beat somebody's ass as quickly as you can. Um, the way that you are able to do that and the way that you're able to be successful in getting what you want out of a feud is actually by cooperation with friends and allies and villagers and other people that you can rely on for information and for lodging sometimes and for support in uh, monetary and supply sense. Um, with Talaker, he, he mentions at one point that they are, they're literally camped out in the woods watching a road for two straight weeks. And this is a really long time to be sort of outside of like your home um, and sort of equipped in battle with like a small group of riders, right? This is a pretty small camp. They have to be close enough to the road that they can keep an eye on it and not be super obvious about it. So they're literally just like, you, you know, go grab your most expensive stuff 
you know, if, if you have armor or anything like that, go camp out in the woods for two weeks and try to like maintain all that all the time. It's really hard and it takes quite a lot. It takes a lot of material support and labor and all sorts of things, right? It's not super easy. And so having the ability of people in the countryside who like you and support you enough, knowing that you're not just going to come and randomly like burn down a tavern or burn down their house or anything like that, you're dependent on villagers to give you good information. So if let's say you're trying to rob a caravan that's coming out of Nuremberg or going somewhere else and it comes into a village and maybe the baker who knows that you're off in the woods sends a boy up into the hills to tell you that, hey, you know, the, the, the caravan you're looking for has arrived. They're going to head out this road in two hours, right? That's really important. And Gotts describes this process time and time and time again of making sure that he has the absolute most up-to-date information that he's sort of in the field first. And a lot of this actually reminds me of the introduction to, to Meyer's book, his Meyer's book on fencing, where he says that fencing is just warfare in miniature. And we can sort of see the way that Meyer describes a lot of what he does in the same sense that we see people who are writing fencing manuscripts talk about the ways in which you're supposed to fence. It's about information, right? It's about fueling. It's about the ability to make quick decisions that are correct given the advantages and disadvantages that you have in your current situation. And you can see these sort of rules, like we can literally graft the five words and throw them right onto a lot of what Gotz is describing and see how this can, this kind of like sense that we can take fencing and explode it into this kind of larger, kind of more tactical strategic network that he has when he's uh, prosecuting these feuds. Um, so, Gotz fights against the, the forces of Nuremberg in 1502. Um, this is eventually called the Schlacht im Wald, the Battle of the Woods of Nuremberg. And this is actually a fairly famous event in Nuremberg history. So this is a, uh, this is actually hanging in like the German National Historical Museum. Uh, and this was a painting that they made to commemorate the battle in 1502. Um, our next slide is going to kind of show this in hopefully a, a bit more detail, but this is a description of a battle that Guts also describes uh, quite well. And this is sort of notable because this is the very first and only time in Guts' entire autobiography where he actually out and out states that he killed somebody. Uh, he said that he, uh, he, he stabbed a, a wagoneer off of his wagon when they were attempting to close the wagon fort that the, the Nuremberg militia were coming out of the town and they were trying to form up this Wagenberg uh, and set up their cannons inside it so they could shoot at everybody. And Gotz and one other knight um, rode up and lanced the, the lead wagoneer so that they couldn't close off this wagon circle. And then they held that gap, he says, for the next two hours. And he describes a fairly confusing battle, which you can actually see in, in this image here, right? So our, our next slide here is, is this whole thing, but you can see how chaotic this looks. You can see how sort of widespread this is. You can see like, we've got the, the Nuremberg militia coming out of the, uh, out of the gates uh, on the lower right side of, of the thing. And you can see all the forces um, up on the top left, which are the, the robber knights and their army coming out of the woods. And this is a, a, another really kind of great description because Gotz actually talks about how um, he and the men he was with, it was like 700 lands connect, 300 Swiss and 300 other men were hidden in the woods while the main body was kind of parading around and they were hoping to lure Nuremberg out toward the woods so they could ambush them. And this failed for various reasons. And one of the things that Gotz says about it is that rather than coming all kind of scattered and broken, the Nuremberg militia were actually like really well composed and well directed. And part of that is probably because uh, the guy in the black coat there gesturing toward the guy in the really big hat is Willibald Pirkheimer, who's one of the most famous Nuremburgers probably in history. Willibald Pirkheimer was also in charge of the Nuremberg militia who went and fought in the Swiss war a couple of years before. So this is just sort of highlighting Pirkheimer and some of the other kind of Nuremberger leaders who are obviously experienced and very capable men who were not really easy to lure into a trick, right? Um, so the end of this battle is maybe a little disparaging because uh, Gotz tells us that he is told a few days later that after their battle, when the kind of forces of the Margrave couldn't pursue the Nuremburgers for various reasons, because it was a pretty tight thing, but they had like panicked and run back into the city. And everybody was so panicked that uh, Nuremburgers were like trampling each other at the gates and pushing people into the, the river and the moat 
uh, over the bridges and everybody thought that the town was going to be lost. And God says, you know, if only we had known at the time, we could have taken Nuremberg, which <laughs> would have been quite a thing if, uh, you know, the Margrave Friedrich and a couple of robber knights and a small army capture the free city of Nuremberg in 1502, that would have utterly changed the 16th century. Um, it's, it's sort of interesting to think about the ramifications that may have been involved if that happened. Uh, it didn't though. Um, but up here, this is just a, a bit more of a detail on, you can see the artist attempting to kind of show uh, this kind of unformed Wagenberg. They were trying to, uh, to get started. And I've scoured this image, hoping to find somebody that I could maybe say like, maybe this is Guts, but you know, probably not. He wasn't super famous in 1502. <laughs> <clears throat> so probably the most important single event in Guts's life, uh, maybe he might disagree, uh, is the Lancehope War. So the Lancehope War, not to get into a whole lot of detail about what exactly it was, because again, we'd be here till Christmas, um, was a successful dispute between two branches of the, the very powerful Wittelsbach family. Um, a guy named Duke Georg the Rich ended up dying and violated a contract that he had had with cousins of his uh, that said that if any branch of the Wittelsbach family didn't have an immediate male heir, their lands would go to the other side of the family. So Georg violated that by taking his uh, inheritance and giving it to his daughter, who was married to a guy named Ruprecht, um, who had been or was a bishop at some point. And uh, the other branch of the Wittelsbach said, you know, you can't do that. That's violating the contract. Maximilian, the emperor, got involved. And ultimately, Duke Georg's progeny, his daughter Elizabeth and her husband Ruprecht, uh, rejected, got, uh, rejected Maximilian's attempt to intervene and raised an army. So this was actually quite a big war. This was probably one of the biggest wars um, in terms of like men and people involved and interest of the empire involved. Uh, is an exceptionally large conflict that goes on for quite a long time. Um, Gotts was involved. Uh, he actually tells us, this is just Lancehood, by the way. Um, Gotts tells us that he's a little miffed because two of his brothers were fighting on the side of the Palatinate, that is the side that's allied with Maximilian. Um, or rather the side, the rebels. Um, they're fighting with the rebels uh, and the Counts Palatinate, and he wanted to fight with them, with his brothers. And he was just kind of roped by these conditions of servitude, right? That he, he couldn't ride off and go join them. He had to serve who he was serving at the time. And that puts him uh, outside the city of Landshut in the summer of 1504. And uh, he uh, is part of the besieging forces. And he tells us that he is <laughs> spending a Sunday riding up and down in front of the like ditches that had been dug in front of the city hoping to convince any of the knights on the defending side to come out and joust with him, right? He's like literally riding up and down the line with a spear, hoping to just lure people out so that he could just have some fights with them because that's what you did when you were a young knight. Um, and while this was happening, uh, a Nuremberg artillery uh, or Nuremberg artillerist started firing indiscriminately. Um, he says that they, they fired uh, on Freund und Fiend. So they were firing against friend and foe alike. I, and one of these uh, small cannonballs coming from a culverin, um, which we can see pictured here in a 1513 print by Albert Durer. Um, so one of these field culverin balls uh, skipped along and bounced up and struck the pommel of his sword. And the pommel split in half and it drove one half of the pommel into his right wrist about right here. And uh, he says that he could see his hand hanging by a strip of skin and he had dropped his spear and what, as soon as he realized kind of what happened, he immediately turned his horse around to ride back up toward the, the besiegers camp. Um, at which point he was uh, like, some Lance Connect guys came out and sort of got him off his horse and got him to lay down and everything. And they eventually agreed that he would be brought inside the city. He would be brought inside the city of Lancehood to be treated by their surgeons. Um, he ended up surviving, obviously, we know that, but it was a really bad time. It was like a really, really bad time in the city of Lancehood in the summer, uh, the late summer of 1504. So over the winter, the city was hit with a sickness called the red dysentery. And it killed a lot of people, like a ton of people, um, including, uh, uh, including Ruprecht, who was at that point the sort of nominal leader of this rebellion. And uh, Guts talks about how he 
he was told a servant had come into the room that he was in in Landshut and said that that Lord Ruprecht was coming in. So God should get up and put on his best clothes that he has, right? And so he does, and he's sitting there waiting. And the same guy comes back to tell him that Ruprecht had died, um, which tells you, you know, Guts is probably being a little bit melodramatic here. The timing probably isn't that exact, but we can kind of forgive him because he's probably like racked with fever. He tells us he got dysentery too and managed to survive that um, and is also dealing with this horribly traumatic wound and uh, manages to, to survive and is pretty sad about it. We'll get to that in a moment. But for now, I just want to kind of show a little bit of details about the culverin. Um, God's calls it a Feldschlangen, which literally means a field snake. Uh, and the word culverin comes from the French word for snake. So you can see that the sort of decoration that a lot of these have. So they've got those little like dragon heads uh, back on, on the back end there. And they're mounted on these very complex, uh, like gimbaled mounts that are perfectly serviceable to be used as field guns. Um, and obviously they were used as field guns. Uh, the Nuremberg artillerists clearly meant to like hit people. And that's why he was firing indiscriminately and ended up obviously hitting Guts uh, or hitting Guts' sword rather uh, while he's up there on his horse. So we've also got a couple more images of some other culverins. And mostly I just want to show you these because of how like highly decorated they are. Uh, and even in, in a fairly pulpy woodcut from like the later on in the 16th century, you still see that the artists have gone to great lengths to kind of depict not only in detail like of the carriages that they're mounted on, but also like the decoration uh, that goes into making these, these uh, guns. Uh, because these were, especially if they came from like Nuremberg artillery, were like pride of the city, right? This was a way to kind of say like, look at how powerful and how rich the city is. They can afford to build these like works of art that you can also take with you out on the battlefield, right? Um, and here's uh, these these last two images are from the Kriegsbuch of um, uh, Franz Berger from 1570s, I believe. Uh, and this is just kind of showing some of the, the culverins actually at use in the field. Um, so they were almost 80 years or so before, or more than 100 years before, um, you know, it's claimed that field artillery is really put in use uh, by armies in the Thirty Years' War, that they are actually fairly common and, and used uh, used in field craft and in siege craft um, pretty frequently, pretty commonly. Um, so this is probably the thing that makes Gotz's reputation is his iron hand. And we'll look at a couple of uh, the sort of versions of them, uh, including this one, his very first one. So obviously he had a difficult convalescence. Uh, he took quite a while to uh, it was months. He was literally over in Lenshut for basically the whole end of the summer and the winter. Um, and he got out in 1505 and had a really, he had a really rough time. And he is very open about the fact that he was what we would probably say is depressed um, in, in that, that really rough winter of 1504, 1505. <clears throat> um, he contracted the red dysentery. Obviously, many of the people in Lanshut uh, died of dysentery. Um, and at one point, he straight up in his autobiography, more than 50 years, like written more than 50 years after this happened, tells us that he contemplated suicide, that he prayed for God to kill him, to take him. And this was wrapped up in his ideas of what a man is and what a man is capable of and what a man is supposed to be able to do. And without his right hand, he says he was ruined as a man of war and he couldn't serve as a man of war anymore. His right hand was his knighthood, right? That's his ability to be a warrior, his ability to be a leader, his ability to be a man is all wrapped up in having a right hand, having a sword hand. And the fact that he lost it was very difficult for him to take. As a guy who's like 20 years old, really difficult for him to kind of come to grips with, right? But he tells us that as he's laying there in his, in his bed in Lanshut, he remembers a servant that he had known uh, in his father's court, who was a guy named Kokla. And Kokla, he remembers, had also lost his right hand. And rather than just give in to despair, Kokla had had a, a prosthetic made. And Gotz thought, you know, if Kokla did it, and, and I know Kokla's sons, and I've served with Kokla's sons since then, uh, if Kokla could do it, so can I. 
And so even if I could have, you know, a blacksmith rig up some really simple mechanical hand, really simple, just prosthetic, then maybe I can still be useful. Maybe I can still live a rich and fulfilling knightly warrior's life, right? And it's, it's the fact that he knew of a guy that had had a similar disability that had had a, a good quality life after that, that was still recognized as a man of war after that. And it's that example and sort of that like depiction of it, right? That representation that he had in his life of somebody with a similar disability that he could actually do the same thing. And so he did, right? He decides he's gonna go contact some blacksmiths and he's gonna get something something made. So uh, the, the image that you have there is his first iron hand. Um, and you can see that this has a couple of like spring ratchet mechanisms in. So you could actually change um, two fingers you know, on, on how they moved independently. So you could actually kind of ratchet it down so that you can hold uh, like a wine stem. They've actually done, they've, they've made a 3D printed version of this hand pretty recently at a German university. And they've tested its sort of ability to manipulate things. And they said it's delicate enough that it can hold a wine stem, it can hold a pen, um, it can do all sorts of uh, neat little things. They're, they're even saying that something like this that can be sort of mass produced with 3D printers and various things would like completely change the way that prosthetics are used today because they're very inexpensive and relatively useful. Um, and they can be mass produced anywhere that you can set up a 3D printer. Um, so they're like, this stuff is still being used to like learn useful medical things 500 years later, which is incredible. Um, but prosthetics in the 16th century, even in the late 15th century, obviously, were pretty sophisticated. Um, this was a time that there really were no rules for like anything. Uh, and if we imagine somebody like Leonardo da Vinci, who is contemporary mm -hmm. to Gotts, right? Um, da Vinci is just not letting any barriers get in between having an idea and doing it, right? And there are similar people who, who make a reputation later on in the century as uh, like artists in the crafting of prosthetics, including a surgeon and a physician named um, uh, Ambois Perret. Um, and Perret became uh, an extremely well-known surgeon in the 16th century. He was one of the few in the 16th century that sort of blended uh, the kind of two branches of sort of medical service uh, at the time, one of which was physicians, physicians being kind of academically trained, uh, Latin speaking, like proper doctors, but the thing is that proper doctors don't touch you. They don't touch sick people. They don't touch wounded people. Uh, they don't get into that. They study the theory. And that was separate. That was a separate thing from surgeons. And surgeons typically were more like barber surgeons. There'd be people who are barbers because they have sharp stuff who do things like lance boils or bleed you or cook up an herb tea or whatever. And those are the people that actually like touch you and do things to your body, which is something that physicians don't do. And Perret was a military surgeon for some time. And so he, you know, literally got his hands dirty. He was somebody who was, uh, you know, a, a, an exceptionally skilled surgeon, but he was also a university trained physician. And that was really rare in the 16th century. So I'm not trying to say that Ambrose Perret was the person who like, you know, rigged up this this prosthetic or something like that he, he didn't really kind of start his career in that regard until about the 1520s or 30s um but this is just to say that it must have been a very common thing we still have quite a few surviving prostheses uh from the 16th century quite a few that were made by Perre himself or drawings of those that were made by Perre himself um and Gotts had several of these um we have at least two of them uh, <clears throat> So that first one, which is uh, somewhat simpler, and the second one, which uh, still obviously actually survives, it's still in the Berlichingen family, um, and they kind of keep it out to present to researchers and the general public and everything to take a look at. And this is just one of several kind of drawings that were made by a guy in the 19th century taking a look at this. Um, and this should show you how complicated this whole mechanism is, right? It's really like a fascinatingly complex bit of machinery. Um, and you can see how, it, how it's strapped to the forearm and there are various sort of manipulation, like each digit can be manipulated separately. Um, there's a, like a spring-loaded catch on like the inside of the hand here and on the back of the hand that would release certain springs to kind of let it go out or close the fist back down. Um, and this was another, again, extremely complicated little bit of 
prosthetic mechanism that got used for a long time. He actually tells us at one point, um, probably about 15, 18 or so, he's late. He can't rob a caravan the way he wants to because he had to get something in his hand fixed. So obviously it's something that he's able to put to use. And I know that everybody really wants to know, especially fencers really want to know, could he fight with it? And we don't know. We don't know. Gotts never says if he uses, if he like trained himself to use his left hand as a fencer, or if he was able to manipulate a sword with his right. Um, we, we don't know. Um, there have been some guesses, but we don't know. Um, he definitely fights while he has a prosthetic hand. Um, he, he gives several descriptions of, of various actions that he's in, but he never even once tells us whether it's he's holding a lance or whatever in his left hand, or if he could work the mechanism to grasp a lance or a sword or anything with his right hand. So unfortunately we don't know. Um, and I know that's like the first question everybody asks. So unfortunately, I just, I, I don't know. If, it, uh, if I had to guess, I'd probably say he mostly just went lefty, but I don't know, don't know. Uh, and this is a photograph obviously of his uh, mechanical hand, his second hand. You can see a bit of how the, uh, at least that exterior strap uh, would have worked. Okay. So let's talk about Gotz's sort of busiest time. So this was the, the time between about 1505 after he recovered from his wound outside Lancet to 1519, where he was actually arrested. Uh, the first of several times he got arrested uh, for various things um, after he had some bad luck with the Duke of Württemberg, who was uh, soundly defeated by a rebellion and a counter rebellion and all sorts of things. And Gotz ran afoul of the Swabian League. So until then, between 1505, and 1519, for about 15 years, Gotz became extremely well known as a very skillful sort of prosecutor of feuds, you could say. And this is about the period where if, if you watch any kind of uh, popular videos uh, about Gotz that are made by YouTubers and, and various other kind of popular history people, um, they will very often repeat the phrase that Gotz became a mercenary and sold his services to the highest bidder, which is not really the case. Again, the, the way feuds were very personal. Feuds were something that were uh, extremely personal and very political. And Gotts was very careful about which conflicts he was getting involved in. Um, there are a couple of times in his autobiography, he actually stresses that he made a very difficult decision about whom to serve at what point and why. And a lot of them have to do with, you know, the fact that, well, he signed a contract with let's say Ulrich of Württemberg. Um, and he was trying to get out from under that contract before rebellion happened so that he wouldn't have to serve him in the rebellion, but because he was there, his contract wasn't right. He gets into all these kind of very complex sort of like legalisms about what's right and what's wrong. And one of the things that, that shows very clearly in his autobiography is that <clears throat> um, he's often brought in by family connections. Uh, he is the Several of the knights of the other robber knights that he mentions um, having ridden with or served with or, or at least known were brothers-in-law of his, either because of uh, a marriage of his brother to their sisters or a marriage of his sister to them or, or whatever. So Kunz Schott um, was a brother-in-law of his and um, uh, not Falacker, he was a cousin, he was a distant cousin. Um, uh, we'll talk about him in literally the next slide. Um, Franz von Sickingen, who was the leader of the Knights Revolt in 1523, was also a brother-in-law of his. So a lot of the reasons he's being drawn into various conflicts have nothing to do with greed or avarice. <clears throat> they have everything to do with family connections and politics and wanting to, to choose feuds to prosecute that are aligned with his sort of political and moral uh, and familial ideals. And that's really important to him. And we can also kind of, we should be a little skeptical because obviously this is written after the fact, and this is written specifically to justify everything that he had done up to that point. And so we shouldn't just take God said his word. We should be critical of, of everything that he has to say. Um, but uh, I do think that the sort of popular idea that he just like, you know, sold the services to the highest bidder was just out there to make money isn't necessarily true. However, we should also acknowledge that he did accumulate enormous wealth um, during this period of his life. And it was enough that in 1514, he actually bought a castle. So this background image that you're seeing there is the Hornburg, which is not just from Lord of the Rings. It's also Gotts von Berlichingen's family castle. 
um, which is still owned by his family today, actually. It's run as a hotel and as a restaurant. You can go visit and stay overnight in Gotts von Berlichingen's castle, which is really neat. Um, but he bought a castle for 3,000 florins in 1514. And just to put that into perspective, that's the same amount of money Leonardo da Vinci was, or not da Vinci, uh, Michelangelo was paid to paint the Sistine Chapel. So it's an enormous amount of money. And he was able to make this almost entirely on income that he made robbing trade caravans, a lot of times from Nuremberg, um, but from, from other places as well. Um, this is obviously, this is the Hornberg. Uh, this is just that same image in color. Uh, and this is another image of the Hornberg. You can see kind of a, a very, still looks pretty grim and defensible, right? Uh, still a, a pretty pretty neat little place. And I hope it'd be great to visit it someday. Um, but one of the ways that he was able to make so much money was because uh, it's one thing he was incredibly lucky. That's obviously very true, but he also followed this very particular method that he had for how to make a successful feud. And kind of the first step is again, having good friends and comrades. It's uh, knights that he can rely on to ride with him when he needs extra riders. It's information that he can get from villagers and peasants. It's the fact that he keeps this sort of network of sort of loosely affiliated kind of like spies and informants that can tell him when there are things coming by and when there aren't. And at one point, um, Gotts tells us that he is lying in wait for a particular caravan that's coming in. And he knows that these all of these merchants uh, have this very rich caravan laden with all these goods that he wants to rob. And it's because it would be legally okay for him to rob this, this caravan because he had a declared feud with the people who were either selling or buying this merchandise, which made it fair game it, according to the, the laws of the feud. Um, and just kind of in brief, like, I'm not going to explain all of them because it is quite complicated, but if you kind of think of like the idea of like a privateer or um, like legal spoilage on the high seas, like in, in later naval warfare, that kind of thing is sort of what's going on with these feuds. It's just on the land, right? So if, if you know that if guy A, whom you're feuding with, is buying a shipment of, of fine saffron who's coming in from somewhere else, you can rob that caravan. And now if you're the guy who's just driving the wagons, uh, God's probably doesn't care about you. You know, you're generally going to be free to go. But if you're like a wealthy merchant who happens to be trading with your enemy, then, well, you're kind of screwed. And now you might have to pay a ransom to God's. Uh, at one point, he, he mentions that he captured the same guy three different times. And it's like this poor guy is like stuck going back and forth between like Nuremberg and Heilbrunn or something like that. And each time he runs into it, it's like, man, what are you doing here again? And God's is like, I didn't think you'd be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my favorite anecdotes uh, of this whole thing is that he robs he robs his caravan. He was hoping to catch this one that was piled with all the good stuff, right? And the merchants had done something really kind of tricky, and they'd basically made like a decoy caravan. And because God says it was bad information that he acted on, the servant gave him, him faulty information, he went and took the shitty one. He literally uses the word boozer, which is like evil. Uh, so we're like... He's, he goes and he robs the shitty caravan, but all of the other guys panic and run. They turn around and run back to Augsburg, which happens to be where Maximilian is at the time. And Maximilian, the emperor, gets really annoyed that all of these merchants have now come to him and said, like, you got to go, you got to go deal with this famous robber knight, Gotts von Berlickingen. He's out there. He's, he's, you know, he's captured our caravan and everything. You have to make sure you know, that you go stop him. And, uh, and I'm going to read literally what apparently Maximilian said as reported to Gotts by a friend of his. Um, he says, they ran toward Augsburg and fell at the feet of the emperor and cried to him that they were broken men, that they had just lost everything and they and their children would never recover from it. To that, the pious emperor Maximilian had replied, holy God, holy God, what is that? The one that has only one hand, the other one leg? How would you act if they had two hands and two legs? And that was said of another guy named Hans von Selwitz, uh, who was another comrade of Gotts who had a prosthetic leg. So again, these two guys who are going out, like each of them having some large disability and Maximilian, you know, being kind of uncharitable, uh, goes on to say, <clears throat> how is it that if a merchant loses a bag of pepper, then one must rouse the entire empire and send so many. And in the quarrels which concern the imperial majesty and the whole of the empire that affect kingdoms, princedoms, dukedoms, and others, no one has the power to make you follow. 
So you can see that, that you know, Maximilian's just a little fed up with the fact that, you know, they have to, again, get the whole Swabian League out to go recover your bag of pepper. But like, if it's Maximilian who like needs to be crowned emperor by the Pope, nobody's willing to like send an army down with him or anything like that. Um, and I just found that to be a pretty charming little anecdote that Gus has. But again, so the, the idea is, again, we have these sort of at least kind of three pillars of everything that Guts needs for a successful feud. And that's good information. And good information tends to come from allies who are either friendly knights like Hans von Selvitz, or they're people from the countryside or other peasants or merchants who are willing to kind of give him information and support him when he's out in the field. And also advantage seeking. One of the things that he says frequently when he's describing fights is how he's maneuvering on the field to get to a point where he has an advantage. And that's either by rushing forward and attacking first, right? We all kind of know how we describe this in fencing language, or he's trying to get to a part of the terrain that gives him some sort of like height advantage, or it gives him a way to protect his flank, or it gives him some cover from cavalry. Uh, he talks at one point about how he got caught in an open field and his horse had been lanced, and he tried to run into the woods so that he wouldn't be run down by, by other cavalry and end up getting scooped up anyway. But he's always thinking about how to, how to achieve these little advantages and how he can go from one advantage to another advantage in the same way that we can see this being described in fencing manuscripts, which I think is really, really interesting. So if we kind of take an invert that, that Meyerism, right, that fencing is just warfare in miniature, we can take the reverse and see that that's also true. Feuding is just fencing writ large. Um, and the same is obviously true of warfare at a greater scale. Um, this is a, a, an image actually from the play about Gauss von Berlichingen that was made in uh, the 1820s, I believe, by a guy named Eugene Delacroix. Um, just thought it was kind of neat to include, so. All right, so I'm gonna go through this stuff pretty quickly. Um, this is essentially the kind of, uh, a nadir of Gotz's career. Um, he misses out on the Knights Revolt in 1523 and 24, even though he was brother-in-law with Franz von Sickingen, who was kind of the ringleader of the whole revolt. And part of this was probably because of his uh, actions in the rebellion of the, the Duke of Württemberg, um, who was opposed by the Swabian League, and Gotz was arrested. And he was held in a prison in Heilbrunn for three years. Um, in a prison, I say, but mostly he was living quite comfortably in, in an inn, but he was forced to be in the inn and he had to pay for it. He had to pay 552 florins for three years of basically room and board at this nightly prison, which was an inn that he lived in. Um, he got out in 1522, but he was still basically under the Swabian League's ban. And so he doesn't say exactly why, but he wasn't involved in the Knights Revolt and he wasn't there, which he might have been. Uh, when Franz von Sickingen was killed, when the Swabian League just flattened one of his castles with cannons. And they proceeded to do that for another, at least, I think it's like 22 uh, robber knight castles in Franconia uh, for the rest of the thing. They called it the Rotenberg Confederacy uh, and the Rotenberg uh, or the, the Rotenberg sort of like guild or brotherhood. Um, and they were, it was a network of these robber knights who would jostle captives between them. So that if, if Gotz, let's say, went and captured, let's say, this merchant that he captured three times, and now you have to hold him for a couple of months while his family gets the ransom ready, you swap him between these castles so that they never know where they are. So that if he can get some friends to try to like spring him from the castle while somebody's away, nobody's going to know where they are. They don't know what's going on. So you can sort of keep them in the dark. Um, obviously, this went badly for the Knights. Uh, it was crushed, absolutely crushed by the Swabian League who mostly just rolled up with artillery and flattened their castles, like utterly just demolished them. Um, Franz von Sickingen himself was killed because he was standing on a wall that collapsed under cannon fire and he was crushed to death. So bad stuff uh, happened with that. Gotz was unable to avoid getting embroiled in the peasant war. Uh, <clears throat> so the peasant war or the revolution of 1525 or whatever you wanna call it, was uh, a peasant uprising that had followed a series of peasant uprisings. And it's a very complicated question, but essentially it was started by sort of pressures that were brought in by the sort of almost, this nascent almost capitalism that was kind of changing the way the countryside was in um, or sort of operated in, on a kind of production level. The fact that so many of the poor knights, people of, of Gotz's class 
didn't have an income outside of charging rents. And they had started moving away from charging rents in kind, meaning that you could pay in the food that you raised over that year to paying in cash. And the increased sort of like need for capital, right? Coin, specie. Um, and the fact that uh, because of rising population and various other things like peasants just weren't really making ends meet, plus the long tradition of religiously motivated peasant uprisings and various other things led to this huge explosion of tension and anger in the summer of 1525. Um, one of the largest hosts was in Franconia, which was right next to where Gotts lived. So Gotts living in the Hornburg Castle uh, is brought into, that's, Franz von Sickingen, by the way, I forgot to bring that up. Um, and this is uh, the castle of the family of Opsberg that was torched in uh, during the Knights Revolt. And they made a woodcut about it, how pleasant. Um, so anyway, uh, Gotts ended up essentially being forced to be a marshal for the Odenwald Necker Valley peasant host. Um, they called this the Bright Host or the Bright Band, um, the Heiliger Haufen, uh, they called it, which was, um, a pretty large and uh, one of the more, uh, let's say, um, animated peasant hosts of, of the entire war. They were responsible for the Weinsberg mass massacre, which um, Gotts was petrified of. Uh, he was legitimately terrified that because um, this, had, this had been um, the, essentially what happened was that the, the Odenwald Necker Valley peasant hosts kind of came around the city of Weinsberg. They found out that the castle had been emptied because the Lord of Weinsberg had gone down to talk to the citizens of the town to say, don't let the peasants in. And they did anyway. And peasants got into the castle and seized it and captured his family and then murdered him and uh, his retinue by forcing them to run the gauntlet, which was literally two lines of men with swords and spears and knives and everything. And you walked down this thing and everybody got a chop at you. Um, so Gotts is terrified that this kind of thing is going to happen to him. And it runs through his entire description of his time with the peasants. And there is a lot of historical argument about whether Gotts is saying this after the fact to justify what he'd done, or if he legitimately was frightened and not in support of the peasant motives at all. Dunno, I don't know. Um, it's certainly his version is very convincing but it's because we're inside his head and we're listening to him and what he has to say. So don't know. Um, there's a chance though, that he could have been more of an enthusiastic, um, you know, participant of the uprising. Um, he obviously was not necessarily poor anymore. So there wasn't really much reason for him to go off and join. And the Odenwald and Necker Valley peasant host uh, was pretty good at trying to get sympathy and support from the sort of minor nobility of the countryside uh, and the townsfolk. Um, they were pretty good at that, despite the fact that the Weinsberg massacre made their whole, their whole thing a little less popular um, among sort of the lumpen middle class of, of the country, if we can call it that. Um, this, this host was uh, dis utterly destroyed uh, by this guy, uh, Georg Truxess von Baldberg in uh, later on um, in the summer. And uh, Jacqueline Rohrbach, who was the, the, the person that people said was most responsible for the Wein, Weinsberg massacre, was roasted alive uh, in retribution uh, for what he'd done. So despite the fact that Gotts is very clearly horrified at the Weinsberg massacre, and despite the fact that a lot of ink has been spilled uh, since sort of decrying this as uh, you know, a massive act of, of evil and terrorism, uh, the peasants did not give nearly as good as they got. The, the peasants were utterly and brutally crushed. And things like a guy being slowly roasted to death was more common than any wealthy person who died or had their property stolen or destroyed during the peasant war. So I don't want to give the impression that I'm like on the side of the guys who roasted Jack Land Rohrbach alive at all. Um, just to say that we can be sympathetic to Guts's position where he's so terrified that he's going to be put through the gauntlet by this peasant host that he's willing to do whatever the peasants want. But he also like dickers with them, right? Like at first he says like, oh, I'm only going to lead you guys for eight days. And they say, well, how about two months? And he says, how about one month? And they, they you know, 
And he, he, the way he says it, he's very reluctant. And his role was mostly in tempering their uh, expression of distaste um, and revenge at the, at the upper nobility and the clergy. And he claims to have sort of settled them down. Um, Rohrbach, on the other hand, though, like the peasant host kicked him out because they thought that that was the Weinsberg massacre went too far. So Rohrbach actually left this host and went to find another one. And that was the one that was crushed at the Battle of Boblingen. And that's why he was captured. And that's why he was roasted to death. So eventually what happens is that Gotts three years later, after he's basically said like, you know, if we catch you speeding, you're going to jail. Uh, he is arrested um, and he's tried by the Swabian League and he's placed under house arrest. And the house arrest lasts 16 years um, where he's not even allowed to ride a horse. He has to stay at home doing nothing. He has to get special permission to do things like go to weddings and, and go to parties and go to festivals and things like that. He has to have written permission by somebody from the Swabian League. And he and friends petition the emperor for 16 years to let him out of prison so that he can like just live his life again. Eventually, in 1541, he is brought out of his house arrest um, by Charles V. Charles V, who was uh, the grandson of Emperor Maximilian, uh, has a lot of ambitions in the 1540s. He wants to take uh, Ottoman territory in Africa. He wants to strike back against Ottoman incursions on the eastern part of the empire's borders. And he also wants to hit back against his rival, uh, who is the King of France. Um, and unfortunately for Charles V, that's him right there. Uh, you can see the big Habsburg jaw already forming. Um, unfortunately, the Ottomans and the French have an alliance, and they are literally harrying all of the borders of the empire simultaneously. But despite the fact that God says that it's friends of his who got him out of prison, it's probably more the fact that Charles V literally needs every sword that he can rely on to go on these major military campaigns. So in 1541, he's simultaneously trying to take Algiers. Um, this is a, he wants to repeat a massive victory he had had a few years later, or earlier in 1536, when he had captured Tunis. Um, and he's trying to get an army to go there. He's trying to get an army to go um, to Bohemia to lift the siege of Buda, which had just happened. Uh, it started earlier that summer. And he also needs an army to get ready to invade France. He's trying to do all of this all at once. And so he decides he's going to lift the house, the, the ban that God's has. And he tells him, go get me a hundred of your best friends to ride my service. And Guts, after being in prison for 16 years, is understandably uh, unsure if he still has popular pull uh, with the people that he used to ride with. But he says to his astonishment, he's able to, he has to like turn people away from riding with him uh, when he goes on this, this uh, attempted march from Germany into Austria, into Bohemia. Um, and he's blown away by the fact that there are so many people that respond to him and want to come and serve with him. And he's like still popular. And we get this sort of palpable sense of emotion because uh, that attempt to go relieve Buddha utterly fails. And the vast majority of the army dies of camp diseases in the summer of 1541 before they can even get to Bohemia. Um, and the Ottomans capture Buddha it's one of the largest scale sort of uh, one of the large scale battles of, of the period. Uh, this is a woodcut of Buddha from the 1550s and our Budapest from the 1550s. They're able to capture it before the army can even get there. And many of these young men who ride with guts because of his fame just die basically shitting themselves to death because of these camp diseases. And he's a little bit embittered uh, as a result of that. And it shows through even in his writing from a decade later. Uh, a couple of years later, he also participates in uh, a, a brief invasion of northern France <clears throat> and the siege of Saint Dizier in 1544. And this is another woodcut uh, from the 16th century or 17th century showing the siege of Saint Dizier. Um, that was successful. And the rest of the campaign is basically just like burning down tiny French towns while they politely shove the French civilians out of the way uh, and torch their cities and then ride back home. Um, but again, these are like the last things that God describes in his autobiography, and they're a little, uh, a little less adventurous than most of the rest of his autobiography because uh, both of these just end with a whole lot of young men got sick and died, and God didn't, uh, and he's sort of left with that hanging over his head, and that's like the last thing he describes. So 
the conclusions I think we can take from all this, right? Like this is obviously as fencers, I think we should be open to looking at uh, casting a wider net in terms of the sources that we're studying to get different contextual information about what this stuff might have been used for, right? And Guts never mentions learning how to fence. He barely ever mentions like fighting with a sword. He doesn't really mention training or anything like that. It's just sort of a matter of course, right? He just learns how to do it. He learns how to do it by doing it. Um, but we should also be conscious of the fact that obviously like he's sort of an in-betweeny, right? He's not quite in Meyer's time period. He's not quite in the sort of the Lichtenauer tradition, the RDL guy's time period. He's in between. He's with like Parnfein. He's in this sort of fuzzy middle zone between the kind of the later expression of like the Kunstdesfektens tradition and the earlier. And he has a lot of the same ideas. He's thinking about advantages. He's thinking about having initiative. He's thinking about timing. He's thinking about information. And we can map that all to fencing actions and fencing philosophy which is really, really interesting. But he also is an eyewitness to the fact that the world is changing utterly, right? Like he himself converted to Protestantism probably when he was in an inn in Heilbronn, um, 1519, 1520 or so. And he's literally watching the world change around him and sort of commenting on it. He's very conscious of it, right? But a couple of things I like pointing out is that um, Gotts, despite having been described by many, many people and even historians as a soldier, I don't think thought of himself as one, right? Like there was clearly a sense of duty and service that he felt was owed by him to other people, to the Hohenzollerns, for instance. Um, but almost all the time he uses the terms like Ross and Fuss. So that's, you know, horse and foot, uh, that's cavalry and infantry. He uses Landsknecht, um, he uses Reisiger, he uses uh, Kriegsvolk um, and various other terms, never uses the word soldier ever in the autobiography at all. And it's really interesting because it's the same way that Meyer describes soldiers, the way that, that Forgang translates soldier in Meyer's introduction is almost always horse and foot or Kriegsvolk, never soldier, never Zoldat, um, which I think is very, very interesting. And it connects to the idea of uh, historian John Lynn has suggested that a better way to understand warfare in this period from about 1400 or so till probably about 1700 until the regimental systems are really kicking in in mainland Europe, um, that a better way to understand these is not necessarily looking at them as soldiers, but as a part of what they call the campaign community. Um, and I think that we can understand Gotts as part of a feudal, a feuding community, right? Not feudal in the sense of the feudal political system or economic system, but feudal in the sense of like, these are people who fight feuds. Um, he's also very, you know, he, he, he's giving this description of a, of a sort of a conducting warfare or fighting feuds as a vocation rather than a profession. And I think that this, the, the distinction is very subtle, but it's definitely there. Um, and I think it's, it's stuff like this, it's stuff like the autobiography of um, Georg Kronzberg and a few of the other kind of like famous diarists and autobiography writers of the 16th century kind of give us a lot of detail about this kind of thing. Um, but he also was uh, a person who, with a disability, and he was a person who flourished despite that disability. And that tells us a lot about the state of medicine and the state of prostheses in the 16th century that I think we tend to kind of uh, not think very highly of, right? But like his prosthetic is, is really sophisticated. His, um, the treatment that he had in Lansford was obviously enough that he survived. Um, and it was enough that, to keep him healthy for the rest of his very long life. Like he, he lived for a very long time um, in a period where most people would, would think that you probably tap out at about 60, if that, right? Um, and I think the most interesting things for me for reading his autobiography is, especially as a fencer, is the way that he depicts sort of the art of the violence that he's a part of, right? It's, there's part of a system. There's an intuition here. There's a skill in prosecuting a feud and pulling something off in just the right way. There's, there's a, a sense of, of like a thrill that you get from like pulling off a coup of intelligence and deception and you know finding the 95 merchants from Nuremberg who think you're across the, you know, way across the country, you manage to surprise them and capture all of them. And there's like a palpable sense of 
thrill that he gets that's really similar to the way that I feel sometimes when I pull off a particular complicated movement in fencing uh, or something like that. And most notably, I think that uh, I think a lot of modern Germans would probably know Galtz more or less through this guy. This is Goethe, the, the playwright, right? Um, this is the guy who wrote Faust. And his first play was Galtz von Berlicking, Galtz of the Iron Hand. And he wrote this, uh, this play that sort of dramatized elements of uh, Galtz's life, including the, the moment where he told um, somebody outside a castle he was trying to get into to lick his ass, lech mich im Arsch, um, which is a, a still a common phrase that's used in parts of Germany today. Um, but the literary legacy actually inspired a whole bunch of other stuff. So there are at least three or four movies that were made of Gods von Berlicking, starting with a silent film in the 1920s. Um, so that's this guy here. And we've got another one made in the 1950s. And I think this just came out in 2014 or something, but we have this like Hercules, the legendary journeys looking kind of action TV show. And you can see up at the top, you know, the it's, let make him arsh it's really trying to sell the uh action adventure man you know this this brown and gray leather version of history that uh was popular a few years ago um but uh that's all i've got for you so if you have questions um feel free to go ahead and ask now i will get the uh the chat up didn't see anything there but yeah feel free to ask questions toss them in the chat if you want or turn your mic on and just go ahead and ask me directly that movie on netflix I don't think it is. I've looked. <laughs> yeah, we might have to might have to, you know, email your German fr friends, see if they can get you a copy, I guess. <laughs> One question here. Um, how did uh, did Gotts have to pay some of like a fine or something to get out of his house arrest? Yes, he actually paid a fine a fine of two thousand florins. That was Good his Lord. first. That was his first house arrest in uh, when he got out in fifteen twenty two. He owed two thousand florins to the Swabian League to get out of there. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't, I can't remember if he had to in the fifteen forties when he started writing for Charles V. I think he was the Swabian League by that point didn't exist anymore, so he didn't really have anybody that he owed technically. Um, but I wouldn't have been surprised really either way if Charles V was like, yeah, you owe me thousands of florins or he just commuted it entirely because he needed men more than he needed money. <clears throat> it's good to be the uh, king. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a question here in the chat. It says, was the distinction between soldier and other terms for war adjacent people, uh, did it reveal a distinction of class, like burghers and such being considered soldiers rather more than noble types? I. It's a good question and a complicated one. Um, so Gotts uses Landsknecht or Knechte, which is, um, Knecht mostly just means servant, but it has sort of like a, a martial flavor, right? So it like, it's almost the same connotation that we'd have if we use the word like goon, right? Or like a mafia goon, right? Technically, there's somebody who works for another guy and is paid to like do violence, um, but they're not a soldier. And that distinction, um, obviously it is a class thing, right? Because like rich guys like Gotts aren't lands connected, right? They're not, they are, they are men of a retinue. They're men at arms. They're people who are, um, they're, they're what you might call Kriegsvolk or Reisiger, which sort of means like man at arms or armored mounted man. Um, so certainly to an extent that is a class thing, but the class distinction between people that we call soldiers, like say in the 1580s, 1590s, or in the 17th century, are basically the same kind of people that would have become lands connected. So it's not, there's not a super clear distinction between somebody who would be still considered connect at that sort of level of just a hired man, a goon, <laughs> um, and somebody who would be a, a Zoldat, right? A, a Zoldat basically literally comes from like the money that they are paid, right? It was a, a Zoldati, which was a, a type of like Italian currency. Um, but the, the connotation of soldier is a political one more than it's a class one. Um, it, it basically means like the connotation of a soldier in terms of like military history is that they are subservient utterly to a rigid structure of command that ends, uh, begins and ends with the state. And without a state, without like 
we mean a state in the sort of historiographical sense. Without a state, you can't really have soldiers. And John Lynn, who I talked about with the campaign community sort of theory, um, makes the distinction that lands connecta and other mercenaries in this sort of system and culture of warfare were more like almost like this is a sort of a very very loose um, kind of comparison but almost more like a union than they were subservient to the territorial state right so like um when we think of the types of the means of resistance that mercenaries had to protest things like lack of pay um were very different and dealt with very differently than soldiers would be right and the the difference essentially comes down to like if a lands connector decides to mutiny with his boys and they go on a pay strike you have to negotiate with them or they'll fucking walk away right whereas with soldiers you just get the next the next regiment over to come and shoot them or you string up their ringleaders and execute them in front of the entire army and I, I would make the distinction essentially in terms of authority versus uh, a distinction of class. And we don't really start seeing the word soldat um, as a really kind of popular common word to use to describe large groups of armed men until about the 1580s in the wars in the low countries. Um, and there's a, there's, you, you can actually kind of track the difference in uh, in how they're portrayed based on, on the progression of that war and the different systems of subservience that were given to the, the leaders of that of, of those armies. Um, almost like the difference between a W-2 and a 1099, an employee versus a freelance contract. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, and like there, there is a lot to be said. Like I would highly recommend the book um, Women, Armies, and Warfare by John Lynn, where he talks about the campaign communities and he talks especially about sort of women's role within campaign communities. Um, and it's it's an, it's a really engaging, really fascinating book if you're interested in this kind of thing. And it it, it really I think it makes a very compelling case for seeing warfare as something fundamentally different in the 16th century and before than it was by the 17th century, by the Thirty Years' War, when they're really kind of hammering out what eventually became state systems of regiments and um, sort of armies put under state control. And I mean, there are reasons for that 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 go beyond like the fact that everybody just wants more control, um, the sort of cartoon version of like state building that's that's kind of popular these days, but there's a lot more to it than that, but it essentially is like, I think the difference between mercenary armies and like proper state armies is literally one of, of authority and not much, mel not much else. Um, the house arrest was enforced basically by if he left that in, somebody would tell someone and they would come and arrest him. Like he probably could have left, um, but it was mostly like he promised not to leave and they trusted him, so he didn't. Um, and that that's a, it's a really common thing. It's sort of like, we can see it playing out in miniature um, with that little feud that he had with the Polish knight <clears throat> um, early in his life, where he, he basically like had to be asked, right? By his lordly peers to just acquiesce to go to prison for 15 minutes. Right. And one of them even offered his coat to him to be like, look, you know, this isn't um, no, I don't think there were any guards stationed outside of his inn. I don't think they would have wasted the money uh, to do it. But there was like we know the guy who owned the inn. His name was like Hans Dietermeyer or something like that. Hans Wagenmann, something like that. I'd have to look up in the in the autobiography again. But um, no, I, I doubt they actually employed a guard that would that would have been a lot of money to spend just to make sure a guy sat there uh, and watched him. Um, so I, I think it was, it's mostly, it's like a parole, uh, if you're familiar with that kind of idea from like 18th, 19th century warfare, uh, like early in the American Civil War, you captured a guy and you left him to leave on parole. And you just said, like, if we catch you fighting against us again, we're going to hang you. And for the most part, that was reliable for a while until things in the war changed and they had to basically start putting people in prison. Um, but that was something that was, uh, by the 1860s, was pretty rare. Um, prison camps cost a lot of money. You have to staff them. You have to feed not only the staff, but also the prisoners. You have to have medical care. You have to make sure that they have clothes and food and everything. And it's really expensive. Gotts had to pay for his own prison, remember, he paid 552 florins. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I think it was mostly just honor system, which was a thing that still was very much in vogue, let's call it. 
Um, there are multiple English translations of God's autobiography. Um, so the one I would mostly recommend is the one that I wrote. <laughs> um, it's not out yet, of course. I've worked on it. The, the first pass of the translation is finished, and I'm hoping to uh, publish it at some point. But it's um, I'm combining sort of a biography with the autobiography. And so like a lot of the work in like writing up the context of the peasant war and things like that is unfinished. But the actual the actual meat of the autobiography is finished. Um, I read previously uh, uh, Dirk Rotgard. Um, I'll actually put up the next slide because it's sources. Um, Dirk Rotgard, uh, Dr. Dirk Rotgard wrote a translation that was initially published, I think in 2014, um, which I would basically say, don't waste your money and just find a PDF version of like the Google Books version of God's autobiography and use like DeepL or Google Translate because like Rotgart's translation is very close structurally and grammatically to the German. And he did that on purpose. And so it's just as difficult to read as, as it would be if you just ran the whole thing through a, a you know, a, a, an internet translator. Um, it's really unpleasant to read and it's not very good. It is on the other hand, packed with footnotes. Um, so if you're interested in the context and that kind of thing, I would recommend it for that. But I would also caution you just, it's, it's not very pleasant to read. <laughs> if, you're, if you're really familiar with German, it, you might as well just read it in German more than anything else. <clears throat> um, okay, so can I give an example of some of his contemporaries such as von Sickingen who consider themselves soldiers? It wasn't really a term that was like at all used. Uh, and again, it's, it's a difference between vocation and uh, profession. Um, I'd say maybe the closest, the, the person we maybe think of as being more soldierly than anybody else would be somebody like um, Georg Frunsberg, the father of the Landsknecht. But then again, he was a Landsknecht and he was very sort of jealous of the fact that he was a Landsknecht and not a soldier. Um, although his autobiography does use Zoldat uh, a, a, a lot more, but he wrote it later than Gotts did, uh, I believe, or his son did or something like that. I have to double check. Um, but no, it, it really was... Uh, Zoldat is something that you see in um, cities talk about Zoldat, um, and Zoldat are just hired men who work for the city. So it's sort of like uh, the, the term Amtmann, which was sort of a, an appointee of, uh, of a town or a city, so somebody like a sheriff or a bailiff, something like that is Amtmann or Amtleute, who are servants of the city, uh, I guess, appointees of the city, officials of the city. Um, and Zoldat is often used for like semi-permanent forces like gate guards or um, uh, wagon guards or caravan guards, that kind of thing. Um, you see soldat every now and again to describe them, but it's really, it's a very rare word to see before about the 1580s. Um, it's just, it's, they're, they're operating on a very different cultural paradigm than, than we are now, obviously. Um, who was the autobiography written for and how was it published? So it was, there were si at least six manuscripts that were made of his autobiography. And it, they were written for mostly like his peers uh, more than anything else. He, he tells us that he was actually like talked into it by friends of his who said like, you should write, you should write your life story. You should write an account of your feuds um, because he, he sort of developed this, uh, if Umschneider is to be believed, he, he developed this kind of like reputation as like a uh, raconteur, right? Going from, from wedding to wedding and, and, and other kind of special occasions and like telling stories about his life. And you can sort of get that sense, like when I was working on the translation and getting to a point where I could just sort of like sight read the thing without having to look up a bunch of random terms, um, you really kind of get the sense of this sort of flow and performance of a lot of the stories and you can really tell like the diction changes when he gets like excited about stuff or when he's telling a story he thinks is particularly funny or interesting and so we think we Olmschneider thinks he was probably dictated rather than written but it was written as a manuscript and then the manuscript was copied at least five or six times at least those are the ones that we know of through either reputation or because they've survived um, it really didn't get super popular until Goethe got a got a copy of it until it was, uh, there was a printed version made in the 1730s, I believe. And then Goethe found a copy of it and then he wrote his play and then their subsequent editions came out after that that were way more interested in him because the play was actually rather successful. It was very popular. 
Um, but initially it was written mostly for other peers or other Franconian nobles and other sort of men of war and the, the lesser nobility to serve as sort of an object lesson and also as a way for Guts to get out ahead of rumors about him and his family. So it was, he doesn't dedicate it to anybody, which would be lovely if he did. Um, at least the, the surviving manuscripts we have aren't, don't have a dedication. Um, he, he literally tells them like, to good friends and comrades is, is how he sort of presented the, the frontispiece of, of at least one of the manuscripts that we had, so. Um, and the last comment there, a soldier probably didn't have enough financial independence or importance to have an autobiography or written account. There are some, um, there are some from a little later. So there are a couple of biographies or autobiographies or accounts of adventures that were written by soldiers who fought in the 30 years war, like very just common soldiers. Um, one of the earliest sort of very popular German novels uh, is a book called Simplicis Simplicissimus, which is actually like, it's a fictional, almost parody of a soldier's like account of their life and adventures, because those were so popular and so widely written by the 1630s or so that they were literally, they were being mocked by novelists, right? So 15, like, Gotz's lifetime is, is too early for just your average soldiers to be writing diaries or letters home or anything like that. It's not quite there yet, but all, about a hundred years later, it definitely is. Um, and we start seeing a lot more autobiographies. The 16th century is still, still very early and it's still like, there's kind of like genre dead ends that are still kind of at play. Like Gotz is part of a, a small group of relatively wealthy, obviously literate, um, Kriegs folk, men of war, who, who write autobiographies for various reasons. So Willibald Pirkheimer, for instance, uh, our Nuremberger friend who was on that painting and who was the leader of uh, the Nuremberg detachment in the Swiss War, uh, wrote a history of Switzerland and an account of his time in the Swiss War in 1499. And he wrote it in Latin and he wrote it as a history. Now, Gotts obviously doesn't write this as a history. He writes it as an account of his feuds and his political squabbles, basically. And Georg Frontsberg writes his autobiography as a way to celebrate the empire. And so like all of these guys are sort of doing kind of the same thing, but for slightly different reasons, right? And it's, it's really, really, really interesting um, to see that this sort of genre that eventually becomes you know, the soldier's diary, the, the published kind of experiences of soldiers, which is such a massive genre now, it became a huge thing in the 18th and 19th centuries, sort of really being formed at a culture that's just getting to the point where there are so many people that are literate, um, at least in the vernacular, that they can write these things for essentially popular consumption, right? Um, so yeah. Uh, I don't know enough about the surviving manuscripts of Gotts, unfortunately. I know almost nothing um, about, about sort of that, that particular aspect of it. I wish I did, but I, unfortunately I don't. I was literally like using the free version, the Google Books version that's on Google Books to do the translation as I was going. So I only know that one, which is a printed version of one that was printed, I think, in the 18th century. So I, I'm not the expert on the manuscripts, unfortunately. Yeah, so there are there are other diaries written by Lensknechte and and other officers and whatnot. Again, it's it's a this is where the roots of the genre are really kind of getting started. There's there's other things that are kind of um, somewhat more fanciful. Uh, this is still a genre that is heavily influenced by chivalric literature, um, and there are some accounts of uh, I wish I could remember his name. There is a Bohemian. Uh, you, you sort of a young nobleman um, from Bohemia who goes on various adventures and he also wrote an account of all of these things of his travels and adventures and everything and that one is um it's he it's literally named like the Bohemian Odysseus and so you can still see that there's a lot of sort of genre trappings of like earlier chivalric stuff that is sort of being shuffled off because we have guys like Guts who wasn't let's say classically educated um, he was obviously literate, right? He did go to school when he was young, but he didn't, he obviously didn't go to university and like learn 
literature, right? So he's just sort of like, yeah, here's, here's my life. Here's, okay, I did this for this reason. So please don't arrest me or my sons, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, any other questions? Any last questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I, I would talk about guts every day of, my week, of the week if I could. Um, so another thing to keep in mind is I am actually, so obviously I, I've, I've worked on this translation. We'll see about publication at some point. Um, if you desperate to read a version of it, go ahead and get a hold of me either on Facebook or send me an email or put a comment on my Ko-Fi page, which I have in a link down there. Um, and I'll, I'll see about getting you a copy of at least some of the translation. Um, if you're absolutely desperate for it, just you know, reach out to me that way. Um, otherwise, I kind of want to keep it close because I don't know, again, where or when it might be published and I don't want to get in trouble with any possible future publication for just mass distributing it for free before they can make money off of it. Um, but uh, I'm also, hopefully within the month, going to start dropping podcast episodes of a podcast I call Murder Hobos, which is uh, done by me and my friend Tony, uh, Tony Williams from Minneapolis. So it's a biographical podcast about 10 men through history, which we're going to punctuate every two weeks with a Q&A episode about each one. And our second episode will also be about Guns von Berlickingen. So uh, obviously find me on the internet uh, when, when that goes out and we will, uh, I'll make sure you, you have the link and you can follow that. So, uh, thanks again. Uh, again, I really enjoy this stuff. So I'm glad you are here and thanks for asking the questions and stuff too. Thanks. <laughs>